Chapter 19 opens with a jubilant worship service in heaven, hailing the victory of God's kingdom. And friend, let me tell you tonight, the victory's already been won. It was won by Christ at the cross, and this victory will be the victory of God's kingdom over this fallen kingdom or this fallen world. Revelation 11, going back just a second and stepping back, John said this, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now, have you ever noticed that in the pages of God's word, every time there's a glimpse of heaven in John's vision, Worship is taking place. Every time in the consistency of what John writes under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, every time he gets to this place and he's talking about, and we get this glimpse or he reveals things through his word about what is happening in heaven, it's always centered around some type of worship. I'm going to tell you, worship will change your life. Worship will change everything about you. It'll change your attitude. It'll change, it'll lift you out of the depressions of this world. It'll just work miracles in your life. But you've got to learn to be a part of the worship. Worship is just not showing up and occupying a seat on a pew. Worship is when you get involved in the worship. Because worship is acknowledging the greatness of our God and, and proclaiming it. And there's nothing wrong. I know we go sometimes to churches and Sometimes they are dead as a hammer. But God hasn't called us to deadness. God has called us to life and liberty. And, and I believe where there's life and liberty, there's rejoicing and praise. So I, I believe it's important tonight in our worship tonight, there's nothing wrong with saying praise God, amen, hallelujah. There's nothing wrong with clapping your hands. That's, there's seven acts of praise found in the Word of God, and I'm not going to preach that tonight. But there are seven acts of praise found in the pages of God's Word. And we need to incorporate every one of those acts of praise into the worship services that we are participating in. I'll preach that again for you someday. Hey, this is not a coincidence of what is happening here. God's heaven is a place that is glorious, exuberant, and lavish, and never-ending worship. Can you imagine? They're worshiping in heaven tonight. This time tomorrow, they're going to be worshiping. This time last week, they were worshiping. This time last month, last year, 10 years ago, a century ago, right on back through time, right on up to the, the place and the point that we enter in that great city of God. Worship is in the order of heaven. So that's why I encourage you tonight. This is practice ground. You know, this is the place where we really learn to worship our God and to praise him. You know, it's amazing. It's amazing how worship will change you. It's amazing how worship will resonate within your spirit and your soul. How it draws your attention off of yourself. And how it draws your attention. Because I believe tonight he's worthy of our worship, don't you? I believe tonight he is worthy of our praise. So realizing this tonight, now an overlay that, of, of reality tonight is the fact that our Lord exalted us to pray, and he said, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So it's important tonight that we're accomplishing the will of God, and it is God's will tonight that we are in a position of worship. Now, contained in the opening portion of Scripture tonight, some years ago, and uh, I preached a message on from Revelation 19, and somewhere in the archives of, of cassette tapes or whatever, uh, I have an, a copy of when I preached on the message of the four Alleluias in Revelation 19. Now, if I start on that tonight, I'm going to guarantee you, I'll never get off of these first six or seven verses. So I'm going to try to bridle myself tonight that I don't get hung up here. Merlin likes this, this portion of Scripture. February 19, 1990, that I preached the message on the four Alleluias. 
my God in heaven. I think I had dark hair then. <laughs> and I think some of you had hair then. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> but let's open tonight with Revelation 19. And after these things, now you can underscore and you can tonight mark these in your Bible or on a piece of paper or something. And uh, I had a study guide, and you know what? I was supposed to run it for you, and I totally forgot it. I'll have it for you by Wednesday, and you can, you'll have all this outlined for you tonight. Okay, so if you're sitting there trying to take every note of everything that I say tonight, you're not going to keep up. I've already taken care of that for you, and so I'll give that out to you Wednesday night. I apologize, I didn't get it to you. So he says, and after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven. Guess who that is? That's you and I. What are they saying, Pastor? They're saying... Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. Oh, tonight, there's no salvation apart from Him. There's no hope apart from Him. There's no honor apart from Him. There's no glory apart from Him tonight. There's no power of, uh, of, apart from Him tonight. Thank God. We can say hallelujah over the salvation, the honor, the glory, and the power that is contained in our God. And God then takes that power, that glory in tonight, that, that hope and that honor and that power that we possess tonight. And he places that within us tonight that we can shout hallelujah. What a mighty God we serve. Amen. For the true and righteous, for true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. God holds the scorecard, and God will even the score. You don't have to even nothing tonight. God's already got that. And again they said, what? Alleluia! And her smoke rose up forever and ever. I'm going to tell you tonight, that which is built on this world will not stand, but that which is built on God tonight will stand and withstand any storm Anything that happens in life, God will bring you through that, and you can shout hallelujah over it. Amen. And the four and twenty elders, the four and twenty elders, that's twenty-four, that represents the Old Testament, the New Testament. And so therefore it says, and the four and, uh, the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshiped God and sat, and sat on the throne saying, Amen. Hallelujah. Man, here's a, here's a feast of worship going on in heaven. And it doesn't cease. And a voice came out of the throne saying, praise our God. Folks, listen, that was not a suggestion, a suggestion that was not tonight trying to motivate. It was a command from God that we are to praise our God tonight. Preacher, it's hard to praise him when the bottom's falling out. Preacher, it's hard to praise him when you're facing the trials of life. Preacher, it's hard to praise him tonight when you're going through times of torment and, and from hell and the devil is on your back and sickness is all around you and you just seem like there's one issue, problem, and circumstance after another. God said tonight, your worship is not conditioned tonight on what's happening around you. Your worship is conditioned on what has happened within you tonight. Amen. And therefore tonight, we, we don't tonight just praise God, worship God, honor God when everything is going smooth. If that's the case, we wouldn't say too much good about him, would we? Honestly. But God said, this is the place. When you're in those valleys, when you're in those dark times, when you're in those places of difficulty, he says that's when you need to lift up your praise unto God. That is your, hallelujah, that's your door out of what you're in. And it just seems like you just can't praise him enough. And the more that you praise him, oh, the greater he gets in your life. My little wife, she was a praiser. Sometimes she scared me. When she was singing on the platform some and praise team, and all of a sudden she, woo! Go. My God, I felt like, look out. Man, I tell you, over there, sometimes when she was running that that computer and throwing stuff up on the screen and doing all. And sometimes, man, the spirit would hit her over there. She'd scream out. Amen. When the choir sings that song, um, oh gosh, the one that Judy sings the uh, lead part on, The Days of Elijah, she'd shout out. I mean, she loved to praise God. Can you imagine what she's doing today? Can you imagine? She's not up there crying. She's up there rejoicing. 
She left me here to do the crying. But I rejoice that she's home safe. You say, preacher, that's odd. She has no more struggles. And I have a promise I'll see her again. And that's what gives me great comfort and encouragement. Praise our God. All ye his servants. See, God did not exempt any of us who are born again. He said, you can't just sit down and give up when you're in the valley of, the, of difficulty. That's the easy way out. It's where you rise up and you praise our God, all ye his servants. That's where tonight God becomes so real, so vibrant. I had more people say, hey, in the world, did you get in the pulpit on Sunday morning, August the 6th, just hours after your wife had passed and stand up there and preach two times on Sunday morning because I have a God who's worthy of praise. Amen. How have you done what you have done? Why didn't you just go home and sit down and quit? Because there's something inside of me that says I can't quit. There's a power that resides in me tonight that says I've got a profound trust on a God tonight that is far greater than whatever I am facing and going through. It doesn't mean tonight that I don't have human emotions and grief and sorrow and pains and struggles and going through some tough times and dark waters and things of that nature. But there's something that says tonight as I, I was reading this last night. Praise our God, all ye his servants. Praise the Lamb of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Come on, y'all. We've got to learn tonight to realize, recognize tonight that it's, it's in those places that of hardness and trial that God becomes so vibrant and so real in our lives. Amen. Amen. That we, we find that, man, this thing is not about me. It's about the God of heaven who's with me, who said, I'll never leave you, nor will I forsake you. I'll go with you through the dark valleys. I'll be a friend that will stick closer than a brother. I'll bring you through whatever you're going through. I will be everything that you need me to be. And if you need a shoulder to cry on, lay on mine, hallelujah, because I'll wipe every tear away, amen. amen. That's the power of our God. And that's what he'll do. And he says, and ye that fear him, fear him tonight means that we revere or reverence God, that we acknowledge him of his greatness, both small and great. And I heard as if it were the voice of a great multitude of voices of many waters. I lived in Cocoa Beach for two years. Cynthia and I did, and there we lived right on A1A. The Atlantic Ocean was just, I could almost throw a rock and hit the Atlantic Ocean. The greatest thing that I had to get used to was the water, the sound of it. Day and night, it's always just thundering, those waves crashing in. You know, listen, here's the voice of many waters. And that, those, the ocean just, I mean, the waters keep coming and they just keep coming in and they keep coming in and they keep coming in. And, and, and tonight, this, this, what he's talking about, the voice of many waters, he's not talking tonight about a fountain of some beautiful place that he has got that there's living waters. He is talking tonight about the saints of God who has tasted of the living water, who has tasted of Christ. And he's saying that these are these are the voices of the multitudes of the people that have assembled there from the north, the south, the east, and the west in that great city of God. And listen, as the voice of mighty thunderings saying what? Hallelujah! For the Lord God omnipotent, the God of all power, he reigns, amen. My God, my God reigns. There is no question about that tonight. Even in the mixed up, messed up, confusing world that we live in, our God still reigns. Amen. I've got to move on. My Lord, it's taken me 20 minutes to get through a couple of scriptures. It becomes clear that the best way to prepare for the future tonight and eternity in heaven is to worship God extravagantly today. This victory celebration quickly then transitions into a 
a proclamation concerning another form of a party. And he talks about a wedding party. Go on down to verse 7 through 9. He says, And let us be glad, rejoice, and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. That represents purity and the purity that we have in Christ. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called, who, my God, unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. You, you'll recall tonight from an, an earlier ex- time that we explored and we basically declared about the first century. We, we did some study on this. Of the first century Christian, uh, the first century rather Jewish wedding custom that the wedding feast occurred. Now, uh, only after the bridegroom and the bride had been secluded for a period and they were away together for a period, a duration. And it's interesting, this custom, this tradition, it was always seven days. Seven in the numerology of God is a representation of the completeness or the perfection of God. So after this week of intimate communication and bonding, then the couple would emerge and celebrate with their family and their friends. This verse we just read here a moment ago represents the announcement for that upcoming celebration that the bride of Christ, the bride of Christ and the bridegroom who is Christ will be together. Jesus and his bride, the bride is the church, the church is us have been hidden away in heaven for a week of years, seven years, seven years during the tribulation and the tribulation period as it unfolded upon the face of this earth and and the angelic announcement of the upcoming wedding feast, we find John falls down and he is in awe of the worship and the things that are taking place and and he's in a place of wonder and he then falls at the feet of the messenger. And this prompts a swift, a swift correction from the angel of the Lord, the messenger of God. Verse 10 says, and I fell at his feet to worship him. John got, man, he's just, I, I couldn't blame him. I mean, all the stuff that God's revealing unto him is overwhelming and overtaking. It really is. He said, I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant. And of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Listen to these next two words. What are they? Worship God. That's it. If you're not worshiping God, if you're putting anything else ahead of God, your worship today is not in alignment. It's got to be God. And I believe that if he's real in your life, I believe you'll want to worship him. Amen. He said, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So please note tonight that final sentence from the angel messenger. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Did you know that tonight your testimony is important tonight? Do you realize tonight that your personal redemption, redemption story? Tom sung tonight about my story. Your story tonight We all share a common story. Maybe we were saved at different places and maybe we were saved by a different message or maybe it was in a workplace or a home place or an altar or in a pew or in driving down the highway or any number of ways tonight places the place is not important it's what happened that is important that you've asked the Lord into your heart and your life so when that point and place of transition happened in your life now God has given you a testimony That's why Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they'll see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. See, your testimony is not you. Your testimony tonight is what Jesus has done in you. Amen. So in here in these last days, shouldn't those of us tonight who have been gloriously rescued by the power of God's salvation from the domain of darkness, and we've been transferred I remember as a kid, I would have to catch a bus from Fairview Heights out there at the corner of Campbell Avenue and Fairview uh, or Seabury, just depending on which direction I was going. And then if I was going to another location, Fort Hill or going to downtown or wherever I was going, I would have to ask the bus operator for a transfer so I could get on the other bus and not have to pay. 
I don't even remember how much it cost, but it's a lot cheaper. To, it was a lot cheaper then than it is now. I can promise you that. I haven't ridden a bus in a long time. Don't plan on doing it. I hope I don't have to do it. Amen. We have been transferred. <laughs> We've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And guess what? That transfer didn't cost us anything. But it cost God everything. Amen. And so therefore tonight, our relationship is with the Lord Jesus Christ. And tonight, we should share that relationship with every person that we meet. We tonight are the walking testimony of the grace of God. We should be shouting over tonight the stories from the, on the mountaintops tonight. We should be declaring tonight, we should not be ashamed of the gospel. Well, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Well, when you don't declare it, you are. And you declare it by, it's not the fact that you're running up to somebody and saying, you better get saved and cramming a Bible down the throat. Your best testimony is how you're living for Jesus every day. Of how you're living consistently, I use this scripture often, that you're steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. See, consistency, steadiness, the quality of a, Real, born again, blood washed, saint of God is the fact that they're serving God every day and they're not ashamed of the gospel that God has placed within their heart. Let's talk about faithful and true for a moment. Follow, following this jubilant, jubilant announcement that takes place concerning the upcoming marriage supper, John sees something that is truly extraordinary and, and indeed the, he witnesses the event for which all of creation has been longing for and groaning for since the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Let's read on. Verses 11 through 13. Oh man, we, we're accelerating now. And I saw heaven open, behold, a white horse. <laughs> Good Lord. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. You know who it is. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes are as a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. Could I? Would you like to guess who it is? I think you know. Amen. It's King Jesus. It's the Lord himself. It's the righteous one. And there is no question about who this writer is. And thank God, he says he is faithful and true. Listen tonight. When you get this faithful and true Jesus involved in your life, you will find tonight your late life where it was faltering and failing will be turned to a life of faith by living for God. Amen. If there's ever been a more appropriate description of Jesus, I've never heard it. This is the perfect, in my estimation, description of Jesus. Hallelujah. Faithful and true. Hallelujah. That is he tonight. Then John adds that his name is called the Word of God. Isn't that what this is all about? Amen. So this is the same John who was writing concerning Jesus in the first verse of the gospel that, that bears his name. And he declared, in the beginning was the Word. I preached on it. Today or in Sunday school or at 10 o'clock, whichever time I did it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the, the white horse rider uh, we encountered back in chapter 6 of the book of the Revelation, he was an imposter. It's not the same one. That was the Antichrist. But now we see the real deal. <laughs> now we see that there is no comparison between the Antichrist and the real Christ. Amen. The sight of this rider is at once glorious and I believe even terrible to behold. I mean, the way that John described him. Here's the Savior who appears not as a gentle, wounded lamb, but this Jesus is a battle-ready king. He's ready to go to battle for the cause. Amen. Amen. And he's armed and he's leading an innumerable host that will be riding with him into conflict. But brother, we don't have a sword. We don't have a spear. 
We don't have anything but Jesus. And if you've got Jesus, he's all you need anyway, isn't it? Amen. Verse 14 reveals, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. By God. That's what the blood of Jesus will do for you. It makes you white and clean, purifies your soul, puts you in right relationship, and enables you tonight to live the Christian life. And note tonight, just a few, just a few verses early in this chapter, in, in the passage concerning the marriage supper of the Lamb, we saw that the bride and his army are one the same. Well, wait a minute. I will be among that brilliant, linen-clad army that will ride with Jesus I got any more riders in here tonight? Shout amen. amen. Hallelujah. We'll be riding too. You say, well, preacher, I've never rode a horse in my life. Well, you're going to ride one then. Amen. You're going to look good sitting in that saddle. Amen. Hallelujah. You're going to be riding high with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And you're just going to observe the, the glorious victory that he's going to give. And then after that, as you'll see in a moment, then there will be a time for 1,000 years we'll rule and reign with him. Hallelujah. Praise God. So if you really know him tonight, who is clothed with the robe tonight, dipped in blood, whose name is called the Word of God, who is faithful and true tonight, listen. I, I just want to stay as close to him as I possibly can. I think I said something about this this morning. I, I tell you what, Jesus might have to say, Carlton, get off my horse. Because, man, I, I tell you, I want to do exactly what the Word of God says. Abide in him, and he will abide in you. Hallelujah. But Jesus said, Carlton, you got your own horse. Now get on your own horse. You can ride with me. Praise God. Riding with the king. Riding with the king. Are you hearing me tonight? You're going to be riding with the king of glory. You're going to see what he's going to do. My God in heaven. You'll be shouting on a white stallion. Amen. You'll be praising our God. And then I, I, I want to show you something else. John's description of this warrior king in battle, his raiment continues because verse 15, 16, he says, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God, and he hath on his vesture, oh my God, listen to this, he has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, look at that, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. My Lord, we're going to be riding with the King and the Lord. We're going to be riding with Jesus, hallelujah. Let me tell you, he, he's king of kings and lord of lords right now. It doesn't have to wait until that point and place and time at the end of the tribulation. He's already there. He's already king tonight. Oh, Lord, listen tonight. You need to crown him lord of your life tonight. You need to make him king of your living. It's not your life. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your being tonight. Amen. I'm trying to give you some practical things to help you in the right time that we're living right now. This is Jesus. This is that Jesus. The same Jesus that gave his life for you and I. Oh, friend, listen. The true, this true warrior king with a sword in his mouth, which is the word of God, he has eyes that are fire. And a far cry from the New Age group therapy leaders today currently preaching in many pulpits today, I'm telling you, some of the stuff that preachers are preaching today is nothing but lies and heresy straight from the bowels of hell. Man, give me the real truth. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes, Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and tonight, I'm going to tell you, before true peace can ever return to this earth, we must tonight realize that a war has been fought and a war has been won that has placed us safely in the confines of salvation that we are securing him tonight. Anybody that tells you you can lose your salvation, you put your finger in their face and you can tell them I said so. They are a liar. How can you lose what God gave you? You can't do it. There is nothing scripturally tonight that supports that idea, thought, or endorses tonight that opinion. And that's all it is. I don't deal with opinions. I don't deal with ideas. I deal only with the facts. The fact says 
For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Does say anything in there? Oh, if you make a mistake. Listen, you're still living in the same moral mess that you were born into this world with. And friend, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to sin. You're going to make bad decisions through life. That's a, we're all guilty of that, right? But I, I'm glad tonight we have a forgiving God tonight who will purge and cleanse us tonight if we will confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Yes, our God is a God tonight of love. He's a love tonight. That uh, love that is no greater love has been ever given by the love that God gave. But his, his is an immeasurable, relentless tonight, furious love. And realizing that tonight only love tonight as pure as this would move a righteous and holy God to lay down his only begotten son on the cross, on the altar of sacrifice, to purchase our redemption. And thank God for a rebellious and thankless race of walking dead people. And that's all we were. And Jesus saved us and delivered us. I'm not dead. You're not dead if you're in Christ. He has quickened you and brought life to you tonight. Behold a love that is so intense tonight that it worked patiently for more than six millennia to bring history to this very point that we are tonight. The ultimate ancient querying of an ancient defiling misery bringing rebellion that we're living in tonight but right in the midst, mm, right in the midst of the rebellion a redeemer comes forth. And his name is Jesus. God reveals tonight that his nature holds not only unfailing. His love is unfailing tonight. But also tonight a fierce anger against sin. So as we come tonight to some conclusion here. The, the, the principles of justice tonight upon which he framed creation. Realizing tonight allow no acquittals. And of the wicked outside the blood of the atoning sacrifice, you cannot get into God's favor any other way except by and through the blood of Jesus. And as the preacher of Ecclesiastes wisely stated, there's a time for war and there's a time for peace. And folks, this world is about to enter into a war. It's not going to win. I promise you. On God's divine timetable is a time of war. And so, therefore, it, it was John's privilege to prophetically and, and purposely tonight to declare that this Prince of Peace, riding out against the Antichrist and the multitudes who follow him, let me tell you what, it's already been declared who the winner is. Amen. You said, well, wait a minute, are you saying the fight is fixed? I'm saying the fight is fixed. Amen. Yeah, the fight is fixed. Amen. Jesus fixed it at the cross. Amen. It's, it's no way. There's no way that the devil can win. He's already defeated. As a matter of fact, if you don't believe that, you go over to the 22nd chapter of the book of Revelation and see if you find him there. That sucker is gone. He is H-I-S-T-O-R-Y. History. Out of the way. Burning in a lake of fire and brimstone. Amen. Thank God. I'll be glad when he is there, and I'll be glad when we are there in heaven. Amen. You and I will possess the privilege of riding behind the true and the rightful king, and we will see him annihilate because here's a promise that is fulfilled. Now, in John's Patmos vision, the day will come and arrive. He witnesses the fulfillment of that 2,000-year-old promise that God gave. And there's, there's a parallel of prophecies. As a matter of fact, the prophet Ezekiel, the prophet Zechariah, they give the same clear. See, this is what's so neat about the Bible. God just doesn't say, oh, this is going to happen. and says it one place, one time, and that's it. He repeats, he repeats, he repeats. So there's consistency in what he is saying. He gives a clear picture that this day is coming on earth. And I'm going to tell you, it's a lot sooner than we think. You say, yeah, but there's going to be a lot of skeptics that say, well, if Jesus doesn't come tomorrow and this this uh, solar eclipse, then it's just a bunch of baloney. Folks, I don't need to know when he's coming. I just need to be ready when he's coming. So if he comes tomorrow, if he comes tonight, that's okay too. Or whenever he is going to come, that's his business. 
My business is to make sure that when he does come, man, I'm ready for that coming and that I'm prepared. So picture the scene. Observer stands just outside the old city of Jerusalem and there on the glorious day and we'll see a brilliant flash of light that will course through the sky. A, a portal will have opened between the heavenly dimensions and, and the spirit and our material world. Something is happening here. God is about to move. And a uh, this patch of blinding white breaking through the clouds will ultimately come into focus. And my God, it's the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Every eye shall see him. Every tongue will confess. Seeing the rapture coming, only the believer will see him. Only the believer will hear that clarion call. But in that day, when he comes back in judgment upon the face of this earth, the Bible says that every eye shall see him, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess. They may have denied him. They may have rejected him. They may have said that there is no God. But in that day, I promise you, my friend, that it will be too late. Because the King of glory, the Lord God himself in the person of the Holy, Spirit, Holy Jesus will come. It's a man in white on a white horse with an innumerable host that a white cloud warriors riding white stallions and following their king. And the lead rider, he, he's, he's racing at an incomprehensible speed, quicker than the speed of light. He steps out of heaven on a horse and he's all of a sudden in the clouds of sky. And he returns. And in that place will be that he will land will be the Mount of Olives. The instant his feet touch this ancient piece of ground, the Bible says a massive earthquake, the rocks will rent and the entire land and the Mount of Olives will split in, split in half and it will be struck by God with a giant cleaver. I mean, God just splits the earth. Half of the mountains will slide north, the other half will slide south. And out of the valley of the two halves will gush a torrent of water. And in that torrent of water, it will basically crate into two rivers. And these new waters will turn the bitter waters of the Red Sea, I mean, of the, I'm sorry, the Dead Sea, into sweet waters of life. Amen. My God. You know, we can't know when the Mount of Olives will split in two. But we can know tonight, literally, that this earth-shaking event triggers it, and it's the coming of Jesus. It will happen when a pair of nail-scarred feet return, touching the last soil upon which he stood on this earth, on the Mount of Olives. Even the dirt recognizes the Savior. And then the last part is the army of Antichrist is destroyed. The final three verses of chapter 19 describe the complete defeat of the Antichrist along with his sidekicks, the false prophet. Revelation 19, 19 through 21 says, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. They're fighting a battle. They're not going to win. And the beast was taken and, him that, uh, and, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of burning fire with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse. Which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. It's going to be a feast on earth for the birds of prey. This is the renowned battle of Armageddon. This is the climax of what is to come. It could be actually called more appropriately the slaughter of Armageddon. As a matter of fact, the Bible says the blood will flow as high as the horse's bridle. The armies of Christ, there will be no casualties. There will be no dead to bury because we are very much alive in Christ. Zechariah 14, 12 reveals additional detail and this will be the 
uh, and, and this will be the pestilence with which the Lord will strike all the people who go into battle with Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot as they stand on their feet. Their flesh will rot as they stand that quick on their feet. Their eyes will rot in their sockets and their tongues will rot in their mouth. This is not the process of death of later the the destruction and the corruption of the flesh rotting away. He said, the eye socket's going to rot, the flesh is going to rot, the tongue is going to rot, and it's going to happen instantaneously. Praise God. Hallelujah. This Antichrist will be utterly, utterly defeated. But let me tell you what. You know what brings about that defeat? It's the defeat that happened over 2,000 years ago at the cross of Calvary when Jesus won the victory for every person that will trust him. Amen. The devil was served his ultimatum of defeat at the cross. The devil never wins, and if you follow him, you don't either. Point blank. And on that day, Jesus promises that his return will finally be fulfilled. And what a day that shall be. One more final thought. You know, from his vantage point, that champion looks across. He looks across this place that is called the Kedron Valley. And up to Jerusalem's eastern gate, which is right now sealed. I've seen it. You have too. Oh, my God in heaven. Psalm 24 says, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. He asked the question, Who is this King of glory? He said, The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. It's going to take more than a few Judean stones and a little mortar to keep Jesus out of Jerusalem. And as the redeemed of the Lord, we can sing and we will shout as the gates are opened and this King of glory goes in and we are with him. There will never be a moment that you, there's never a moment now that you are without Christ. He's with you. This Prince of Heaven, he will go down through the valley, through the ancient gates, up to the Temple Mount. David called this Mount Zion. This place, what's positioned there now is the Dome of the Rock, a mosque. The sight of the shiny gold dome will be no more. It's history. Gone. The gold and everything. Listen. A fresh built Jewish temple will be adorning that hill shining in the beautiful white Judean sun. And friend, on that day Jesus returns to this earth, he is going to go and sit down on the throne of his father David. And he will rule and reign on this earth for 1,000 years. Years. Preached this morning from 2 Peter chapter 3. One day is as a thousand years, but with God it's just one day. We'll rule and reign with him. I'm not concerned about the time frame of this, how long or whatever. To be with Jesus, listen, who's counting? And who cares? Really? Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, this is not science fiction. This is reality. This is going to be literal. This is the real thing. And what we've got to do is realize we've got to make sure ourselves are ready and prepare for the coming of Jesus. You don't know. I don't know when he's going to come. None of us know. The Bible says not even the angels in heaven know the day of his return. But he did say this. Two words. Be ready. That's all he wants us to do is to be ready. How soon is this happening going to occur? A lot sooner than you think. As I have studied intensely from God's word prophecy and I've watched the events of the day and I'm going to tell you what. We're just one shout one breath away from the presence of God. You better make sure you're ready.
You better make sure tonight your family's ready. You better make sure tonight, as the old songwriter wrote, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Amen. I'm not worried about the events that are going to take place because you know what? If God could create this heaven and this earth and God could do all that he has done and is doing and God's in control as he is, I don't have to worry about anything. I don't have to worry about, man, what in the world is heaven going to be like? What in the world are we going to be doing? How in the world are we going to ride a horse? How in the world are we going to see all this occur? How in the world are we going to rule and reign? How in the world is all this going to take? How in the world is there going to be a new heaven and a new earth in Revelation 21? I don't have to worry about that because I got a God who's in control. I just want to make sure he's in control of my life. And you need to make sure he's in control of your, your life also. Father, we come tonight as a close. The time that we tonight have shared, there was far much more that we tonight could share, maybe another, another day, but not today. But there may be needs, and there may be needs of preparation. There may be needs of sanctification. There may be needs of even maybe salvation. I don't know. In hearts and lives of your people. Every one of us tonight represents families. Some in our families tonight are lost. Some in our families are saved. Some in our families are living for God. Some in our families are not. What are we compelled to do? Pray for them. What are we compelled to do? To live for you. Help us to do that tonight as we stand to our feet and we have a verse, a song of invitation. Oh Lord, may our hearts be ready on that grand and glorious day when you shall come. If you'd like a little conversation with the king tonight, here's a great place to have it.